666. Well, first of all, look, this is for you YouTube viewers. You can see I have. Oh, a, look uh, at uh, that. Can you see it? That is spectacular. Uh, Mr. Wilson is wearing an Al Ittihad Club shirt. That's so cool, Richard. Wait, can we see that one more time? Let me, let's get another look at that. You gave us only a short look. That is awesome. Yeah, yes. Cool, man. <laughs> uh, it, it, the odd FC Tigers, uh, you know, the Jetta Club that uh, we've talked about on the show, uh, one of many. So obviously, uh, just, 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 just a tidal wave of news this week. Saudi news and and we're 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 knee deep in it anyway and but even we I mean it's just us just so much stuff and it's really interesting and it's sort of what happens when you have processes that are underway and they break happen to break uh all of a sudden it's everyone discovers it when it's actually been in process but let's talk about so we had a special segment we did on golf and hopefully you guys um you know our listeners have seen that We'll catch that. It was fun and interesting and timely. And obviously it's all the rage in terms of uh, Liv's partnership with PGA. Uh, we're going to focus. My one big thing is on the Saudi professional league, which we've done segments on the Saudi professional league before too, the, the football uh, league, uh, which is near and dear to the hearts of, you know, millions and millions of Saudis and the, the Etihad FC, obviously, you know, this is one of the uh, a major club and, um, uh, and, you know, engenders a lot of, you know, fanaticism and loyalty. So it's a lot of fun to talk about because it's a real thing in Saudi Arabia. So anyway, the, the public investment fund, PIF, is taking a 75% stakes in the four largest teams in the Saudi professional league. Al Nasser, well, Ronaldo, where, where Ronaldo is now, uh, Al Halal, Al Ahli, and Al Ittihad. Um, Nasser and Halal are in Riyadh. I believe Al Ahli and Ittihad, I know uh, they're in Jeddah. So... In addition to the PIF taking a position, significant position, 75%, four other clubs will also come under the control of, of other companies backed by, by the, the state. So, so, for example, Saudi uh, Aramco will buy a stake in Al Qadziya. Neom has acquired an ownership of Al Sukur FC. The Duraya Gate Development Authority has invested in Al Duraya Club. And the Royal Commission for Al Ula has invested in the Al Ula Club. So, this is all Lucian, by the way, <laughs> regrettably, our our plucky Alfaya Orange were not selected for new ownership investment. I um I'm so, outraged. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, I don't know if the, I don't know if they didn't make the final cut, if they're ever in, but we can but anyway, so they're gonna have to keep, you know, you know, keep trying to do it on their own. Uh, anyway, in the in its announcement of the move, the PIF said this, and this is quote: "This sports clubs investment and privatization project unquote has been designed to create opportunities and the right environment for investment in the sports sector, intended to raise levels of, of professionalism and administrative and financial governments and sports clubs while developing their infrastructure to provide the best services to sports fans and improve and improve audi audience experience." Um, and to, to continue that quote, the transfer and privatization of clubs aims to achieve qualitative leaps in various sports in the kingdom by 2030. And, and, and note various sports. They're just picking football to start with. And building an elite generation of athletes at regional global, le global levels. Special focus has been placed on football with plans to position the Saudi Pro League among the top 10 in the world. To put this in context, the, uh, the the Sports Intelligence Agency 21st Group places the Saudi rates the Saudi Pro League as the 58th highest quality league in the world, and this is by strength of its average team. And this puts it between the Scottish Premiership, which is a 49th, but above the Serie C, which is 68th in Italy. So they have grand plans to really up the quality of this league. Um, So, uh, so, so to finish the, the sort of official statements, um, the Saudi Minister of Sport, Prince Abdulaziz bin Turkey Al Faisal, said, quote, by the end of 2023, we'll also offer a number of clubs to be sold to the private sector. And I hope that this will invite more companies from the private sector to invest in these clubs and invest in the sports sector within the kingdom, uh, unquote. Uh, so they're trying, you know, for these to be sort of 
exemplary in 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 setting up uh, clubs to be much more uh, attractive to private investment. The Saudi government said that it hoped that as well as further further bolstering sport, bolstering participation in sport at the grassroots grassroots level, the move to privatization would raise the league's revenues from 120 million last year to 480 million dollars U.S. dollars in 2030, while increasing the league's market value to U.S. two point to 2.13 billion dollars by 2030. Um, and speaking of participation in sport, as we know, there's a, a quality of life aspect of Vision 2030. And in Saudi Arabia, participation in sport has increased from 13% in 2015 to close to 50% in 2022. And the number of sports federations has increased from 32 in 2015 to over 95 in 2022. So I want to get to a conversation on this, but it's another big sports move by PIF Lucian. Uh, as opposed to the the live, which is much more externally oriented, uh, this one is directed internally and implemented to achieve you know specific economic, commercial, and social goals. But you know, like everything Saudi does these days, it will also have a significant impact of the, on the sport of football globally. So, Richard, you're telling me there's a chance for us to cobble some money together and get Alfaya FC by the end of 2023 as they approach privatization, because that seems like a, a really good goal for us to work toward. Um, I, I don't well, know how we're going to get yeah. that money, but you know, maybe, a, I don't know. I welcome any suggestions well, there's, there's, for you. Yeah. There's real upside to Alfaya, that's for sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a buy low situation. Absolutely. But not yeah. low. It's just a, you know, maybe a bargain, you know, you only have a uh, 7,000, uh, uh, sta uh, stadium capacity, we could build on that, work on the profit margins there. Um, no, Richard, I mean, I, this is, this is a really good one. And I'm, um, I'm interested in this because this doesn't really fit comfortably into the international sports washing narrative. That seems to be a very easy crutch for people to lean upon when you hear the word Saudi Arabia and sports. And of course, this was a huge week for Saudi Arabia in sports, as you noted, it's, it's, for this to happen this week is kind of amazing because we had um, the news that Messi was maybe even offered as much as $1.6 billion to go to Saudi Arabia, but chose Miami. Of course, the Live Golf PGA mashup merger that literally nobody saw coming uh, has completely dominated the headlines in the U.S., not just in sports publications, but front page of the New York Times type thing. Um, huge news there. And, you know, what this is like, a, this is a, a move and a story that I think we would both agree was probably months in the making uh, to set up by the PIF, but then also, um, you know, has a real impact locally in Saudi Arabia. And like you noted, and you were just here, like you can see the, the passion in fans here for their local teams. So like, it's a real deal here. Like people really have their, their squads that they like. And, you know, we were just talking right before the show. Um, I had an Uber driver last night who was just so stoked about Ali Tahad winning it all. Um, and then getting, you know, two more international stars in, and I'm going to- Big ones. Ruin, yeah, big ones. Uh, ben Zenema. Ben, I'm so sorry. Benzema? Benzema. Kareem Benzema, I think. Okay. Yep. And then the other one they brought in as well to the Good. same club. Yeah, um, you, you got to do this one. I, I actually don't have it in front of me, but uh, oh, we were just uh, talking it's about- It's almost so impossible. Sorry, yeah. It's Go. it's uh well, we're just gonna go with Conte. Conte. We're gonna say okay. Conte. So I like, Benzema. All right. So this is all right. So this is this is, and I want to draw later. Sorry, I didn't. I interrupted. I didn't no, not at all. That, I'm glad you came, jumped in right there to, when I needed you most. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, this is um, I want to draw some parallels to MLS. But anyway, your point is 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 is, is spot on. This is really um. Uh, 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 to prime the football ecosystem and make these uh, franchises not only more valuable, but more accessible to investment and to generally, uh, you know, get best practices throughout this, this system. Uh, again, they're thinking of it as a, as a, as a, you know, a larger entity. It's not just, Hey, let's make, you know, let's get some footballers. Let's make the system better more competitive, more attractive in the long term, which is why they're shooting to be tenth in the rate in, in the world. That'll be a fascinating thing that, that, that happens. So, so Al Ittihad, 
the Jihad Tigers. The Tigers. That's such a cool <laughs> shirt, by the way. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so they just nabbed uh, Karim Benzema, who this is who just left Real Madrid and is the Ballon this year's Ballon d'Or winner. So he's older, but he's he's the end of his career, but he's still very good. And I cannot pronounce this, but the guy Conte, who's who 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 is leaving your team, Chelsea to join Itihad, both of them on about a hundred million dollar a year contracts. Uh, and there's going to be more. So you've got a lot of reports right now of these teams, variety of teams with PIF backing, of course, in the mix for Sergio Ramos, Angel De Mario, Modric, Hugo Loris, Firmino, Jordi Alba, Sergio Busquets. I don't even know all these guys, but these are, these are, you know, big name teams, big name players that uh, Saudi Arabia is now another option. And of course, there's Messi, who you 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 mentioned. But here's an interesting fact, and 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 it sort of ties up with Messi. We talked in a previous episode about the possibility of Messi going to enter Miami, and um, it, it, you know, to me anyway, it made sense because unlike Ronaldo, Messi still got another World Cup in him, and. You know, that next World Cup is going to be in the U.S. He's Arch- Argentinian. He's apparently he's a big family guy. He likes to be close to home. He knows Miami. He spends time in Miami. Um, and obviously, David Beckham is there. So, but just talking about the economic side and marquee players and this little factoid I thought was really interesting. All right. So this we're talking about the MLS, the U.S. Major League Soccer uh, League. Mm-hmm. Um since Beckham's arrival as a player, MLS has flourished. The, uh, in 2007, the league consisted of only 13 franchises with the newly added Toronto FC paying a $10 million expansion fee to, fee to join. Uh, in May this year, 2023, San Diego became the 30th MLS franchise for a reported $500 million. Uh, according to Forbes, the average value of an MLS franchise is currently $579 million. It, uh, So basically, this goes on to say, this is remarkable, since for that price, you could buy almost any soccer club in Europe outside of the top 20. Um, and Forbes also reckons that no fewer than seven of the 30 most valuable soccer clubs in the world are in MLS. So, and, and by the way, I think, you know, the MLS is rated, I don't know, in the 30s. In terms of top soccer leagues, it's not it's not a top soccer soccer league, um, but you can see, you know, Beckham sort of sparked it, and it's flourishing, it's growing. If you're in, if you invested in a franchise, you're making a boatload of money, um, and you can so you can see that model how the Saudis might be looking at it as well. You know, we can create something nice too. If we can create a competitive, attractive league and start, you know, upping the, the value of these franchises, it gets a virtuous cycle and it just keeps going anyway. So there's so many things all tied up in this. So it's interesting. So two points to make here. One, Richard, I'm going to, my po- first point here is that I need to comment. That is such a good point about the MLS and these other leagues, you know, because we've never really... I guess the perception would be, hey, like there's no league that's ever going to compete with the EPL, the Bundesliga, or, you know, these other, you know, blue chip leagues that, you know, have always attracted the best players. But we've never really known if any other league could because no other league has had big contracts like this. So, like, we're going to find out. But it's like for a long time, the MLS just didn't offer the same paycheck. So if you are the best players, why would you go to the MLS? Well, now they are the best player in the world plays for the MLS you know, one of the best yeah. players in the world now plays for uh, plays in the Saudi pro league. So it's like, we're going to, in the next five to 10 years, we're going to find out just how much staying power these other leagues have like the EPL um, versus some of these quote unquote startup leagues that, you know, once the money starts coming in and once you have these big name players, other players will want to play against them or with them. So that's a really, really good point, Richard, because that makes that makes sense to me, because I, I was talking to a friend who's a huge Messi fan who lives in Barcelona, and he was saying the MLS will never challenge these other leagues. And I sort of thought, well, I mean, 
in what in what measurement are you talking about like interest or fandom because it seems like you could change those things and you can change the players who play in it and you can change how much money's that money they get and who owns the league and then all of a sudden you get some international interest because just like you said earlier I believe you said this earlier I'm so sorry I'm, I'm really tired but um you know the <laughs> maybe you said it before the call but um you know, Inter Miami's Instagram following went from 1 million to 5 million followers, like the second right. that this was announced and ticket prices went up 20 X. So like, I don't know, it seems like if, if you were a betting person, you would bet that these other startup leagues are going to make it more of a multipolar world when it comes to football globally. So that, I just think that that's such a great point. That's my first point that I want to make in response to you, Richard, that, that was brilliant. Secondly, um, a, another stroke of brilliance that we must call attention to was that my co-host here at the 966 podcast actually called this. <laughs> we did a segment on this. He didn't mention it. I was going to see if he wanted to mention it, but I noticed and I knew this. Richard called this like five weeks ago and he actually sort of, uh, you know, pulled a little punking of me on the show. He said, hey, he just announced that he's going to enter Miami. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, really? So I just did a segment about him going to Saudi Arabia and he's not? Dang. But in fact, you had this right, <laughs> Richard, and you deserve credit for that because I think you may have been one of the few people who would have bet this or called this. So that is credit where it is due. That was, that was incredible. And when this happened, when this broke, I was like, oh my gosh, Richard got this right. Unbelievable. So, <laughs> yeah. um, and then the third, yeah, the third squirrel. point that I just want to make, congratulations, by the way, <laughs> another win <laughs> for you. You got Al Itahad and then you got this. I mean, like we need to get you a crystal ball, you know, <laughs> um, but uh, the, the third point that I want to make is I don't know if it necessarily was a bad thing that Messi didn't go to the Saudi Pro League. Like there's a lot of heat on Saudi Arabia's sporting ambitions right now to put it into a nice little package. It's much more complex than that, but you know, the PGA Live thing, you yeah, have for Ronaldo, there was so much going on this week that for Messi then to go to Saudi Arabia, which is kind of would be kind of piling on. I guess I'm saying this as from a PR perspective. I don't I'm not like I don't think I don't think Saudi should be upset or devastated that he isn't coming to Saudi Arabia. And I don't think that I am. I think it's good for the sport that some of these names are breaking off and going to other leagues, not just one other league. So then that's just my opinion, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. And I, I wanted to add to your point about Messi um, and and the followers. So Al Nasser's Twitter followers jump when uh, Ronaldo joined them jumped from 800,000 to more than 4 million and went and that their Instagram followers went from 2 million to 14 million plus. And one of the interesting things about these major clubs in Saudi um, is that, you know, uh, the smallest of the four Al Ahli, which, which actually was relegated last year, was not coming back to the, the, the professional league. Um, they have 2.4 million followers. Uh, and this would put them like they'd be like tenth in the Premier League, and Al Nasser, which has even a, a larger following, have more followers than every team in England outside of the Big Six. You know, and um, so in the Big Six are what your yeah Chelsea, your team, Arsenal, Liverpool, Manchester City, Manchester United, and Tottenham. But but you know it's you can see there's a template here, and it is interesting on both the live and the uh, and the football initiatives for Saudi, like you say, it might've been a little bit of piling on, but in any case, you, you, these are these leagues and, and they, and the Saudi uh, entity are now global players. I mean, you, you know, if you're, if you're a, if you're a, a major football player, you know, you might go to, you know, you might go to La Liga, you might go to premier league, you might go this and that. Uh, but you know, Saudi's in the mix too. Uh same thing with golf. Saudi's in the mix too. And this is what they want. It's soft power. They want to have their prestige things, but also their important um, important initiatives for the country's identity and for where they're trying to get with, in terms of Vision 2030. It's all fascinating stuff. It really is. What a time to be doing a podcast on this, following it uh, very closely. Yeah, we I think it. would be a fair description, Richard, of what we're doing every single day with our daily <laughs> newsletter and this podcast. So it is a really cool time to be following this. And it's sort of interesting because it's like, you know, when you put this big reform package together in 2017, there's 
a ton of big announcements and then sort of a silence of, well, look, this is going to take a while. So, you know, you want to immediately hear an update like, hey, is the line done yet? Are you finished building this 109 mile kilometer city? You know, there's it takes some time. And then you have we're six years into it now. You have essentially like a volcano of stories. You These stories are all building and happening in the background. And then you have like Kilauea today just boiling over a little bit and you have a, a series of stories all at once. And you're like, well, there's really a lot going on here. So, yeah, Richard, a really fascinating one. And and um, kudos to kudos to Messi for going to Miami. I think that's a good move for him as well, because, you know, he has, like you said, family, but uh, it's closer to Latin America. And um, Miami yes. is a nice city to be in, to have a lot of money. Um, so that should be cool. And- and they made it a the Apple, you know, and and Adidas. They made it a good deal for him, and he he probably wants to follow Beckham's path. Beckham, when Beckham came, he said, you know, part of his agreement was I have a path to ownership, which he has done. You know, uh, Messi will have the same opportunity, and and so so you know whatever the value of of Beckham's contract at the time, which was you know you know comparatively was enormous and and very lucrative. You know, the fact that he can now, he had an opportunity to, and he now has the Inter-Miami franchise, which is, you know, the average franchise value is $579 million. You know, that there's wealth. There's significant wealth. So from what I can understand, it would have been very hard to, to compete with the Saudi offer just you know, quantitatively. Uh, but it, apparently the Inter-Miami offer was really good too. And, and like we say, he's still got some more game in him in terms of the, of the, the global stage. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Richard, really good one. Going to stay on top of this topic, of course. Um, we're turning into a little bit of Saudi football fans. Didn't see that coming. Um, but this is really cool, and we will stay on this. It's be- when does the season start in the in the fall, right? This upcoming one starts in like October August or November. May. August, August to May. Okay. August to May. And well, it's coming right to, up. I think they're, yeah. they're, they're, yeah, it is. They're, cu- they're increasing the number of teams, too. So it just, it's just hopping. It's just it's, hopping. It is hopping. It's hopping. It's hopping.